Isaiah chapter 45. And let's read together uh, from verse 20 down to verse 25. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse number 20. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who hath declared this from ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word this morning. Ask you now, Father, Lord, to bless it to our hearts, and I pray, God, that you just uh, have your way now, Lord, and and uh, help me, Father, uh, to preach thy word as it should be, and uh, Lord, that you would just guide me and uh, help me now, Father. Use me, Lord, to be a blessing and an encouragement, and um, we shall thank you, Father, for all that you do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'm so glad to report to you that these words of God are spoken so long ago oh, some 2,700 years or more ago, are still true today. I'm so glad that uh, verse 22, that's my text verse this morning, that you can still look unto God and be saved. Not look to yourself. That's a false hope. You say, but I'm a, I'm a pretty smart fella. I'm a pretty smart lady. I know you are. I'm sure you are. And you're just as smart as the average person, or maybe more. Maybe you got a really high IQ. And that's, that's fine. That's good. And God's blessed you with intelligence. That's wonderful. But you cannot place your hope, your eternal hope, in yourself, no matter how intelligent you may be. Hope is not found in us. Okay? We are finite beings. One day, you're going to die. And after you die... There is nothing you can do to extend your life beyond um, and the spiritual realm the way you would like. You are in God's hand, and there would be nothing you can do about it. Okay? So, ourselves. Uh, false hope. It's not in uh, some experience that you may have had. Some people have strange experiences. They see things. And I, I don't doubt them, you know. I mean, it, it could be that they're hallucinating or or something, but uh, maybe maybe it was something. And I, I, I don't want to doubt people if they say they saw it. They saw it, you know what I mean? But you can't base your hope, your eternal hope or salvation, eternal salvation upon those experiences. And some people get drawn aside in this. And that becomes their salvation. Well, I saw this or I experienced this, so I must be saved. I, I must be going to heaven because I saw this strange, you know, spiritual experience, you know, that I had. No, no. Go back to verse 22. What, is, what does God say? Look unto me and be ye saved. It's not found in ourselves. It's not found in our experiences. It's not found in religion. Religion will let you down. Let me repeat that. Religion will let you down. Religion at best can only relieve your conscience a little bit. But it gives no eternal hope. 
It's not to be found in religion. Uh, it can only be found in the Lord. Okay? Uh, it's not found in any of these things. It's not, not found in angels. And uh, angels are wonderful. Thank God for the, for the angels of God. And, you know, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful creatures. And uh, made by God, ministers of God. And they're powerful and they're wonderful. Uh, but if we had Michael the Archangel here today to speak to you on Zoom, I'm sure he would tell you, do not look to me, do not trust in me. As great and wonderful and powerful as I am, you do not look to me. Angels of God do not want to be worshipped. They will refuse worship. We see that in the book of Revelation. Now, John the Apostle, you know, during the, the revelation of God, these last day things, you know, that he was, uh, was revealed to him, these visions. And on occasion, you know, he would uh, want to worship one of the angels. And they would say, no, 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 don't you worship me, right? But sometimes we think about uh, these, uh, you know, spiritual beings as being, oh, they're just so wonderful, you know, and we looked at them. And these experiences people have, you know, they think, oh, I was visited by an angel or a... Uh, don't look to angels, okay? What does God say? Look unto me, verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, okay? He wants to save you. He wants to make you anew. Born again, set free, made a child of God, a new creature in Christ. Brand spanking new. A new you. Not a turning over a new leaf, not you trying to do better. Uh, new Year's resolutions, that sort of thing that people do around this uh, time of year. No, none of that. Uh, God moving on the inside, you receiving Him, and Him changing you forever. You will never, ever be the same. From then on, you will think different, act different, do different. Uh, it just... He becomes your life from then on. He becomes your purpose for living. It, it all centers around Him, not around you and your ambitions and your goals and your dreams and you know what you have planned. Uh, you are totally yielded to Him and what He wants to do with you in your life from then on. It's not, not to say that God couldn't give you a few things that you want along the way. Okay, He's a good God, all right? He takes all that into account. But... Uh, as a child of God, you are yielded to whatever God wants to do with you. And, but it's, it's a wonderful life. It's an exciting life, you know, because God is leading you and, and it, it's so much better than leading yourself, you know, because we really, we don't know what's best. But he does, you know, he's the all wise God. And to put yourself completely into his hands is just, it's a wonderful thing, you know. What security to be in God's will and be his child, to know you're his child, you know. That is true purpose, you know, serving him, living for him, glorifying him with your life. Oh, now that's true purpose. Living for yourself, oh, what a vain, selfish life, you know. And uh, we, we all, we, we tend to be selfish beings, selfish creatures, you know. But God helps his children to uh, get past that, to um, uh, grow beyond that. And, uh, you know, God's good to help us in that way. All right, but we all... We've got to further to go, amen? And um, to be more submissive, more yielded to him. And the more we do, the more blessing we find. And then it says, um, all ends of the earth. I'm so glad there's hope for everyone. You know, not just a select few, not just the handsome, not just the pretty ones, not just the intelligent ones, not just the rich ones, not just the, um, you know, the ones that were favored or, you know, uh, born with a silver spoon in their mouth or, you know, those that are uh, privileged. No, no, no. It's for everyone. Everyone can be saved. Everyone can know God and walk with God and, and please Him with their life and experience His love, joy, peace, and hope, eternal hope, real hope on the inside. It's amazing. No one is excluded. No one. Uh, don't say, well, I've, I've sinned too much and I, I can't be included in that. I could never be a Christian. I, I could never, you know, uh, live for God uh, like you guys or, 
Listen, we're nothing, okay? We're nothing. We're, we're a bunch of sinners that have just gotten saved by yielding to the work of God in our hearts, okay? It's God that did it. All we did was say yes. We just, we just surrendered. That's all we did, okay? There's no works in salvation. There's, no, there's nothing you do. Um, just, just yield. Just say yes, okay? Will you say yes? Just look. I mean, look how simple God makes it. He says, look. Just look. Can, can you look? Can you look to him and, and turn your eyes away from this world and this life and, and all of its false hopes and, and yourself even? If you can do that, that's when God can work. Okay? If you're willing to do that. But you have to be willing. You know, God's not going to make you. Okay? God doesn't make anybody get saved. Uh, the Bible says, for as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. We have to receive it. I mean, we have to receive the pardon. We have to receive the precious, sinless blood of Christ to cover our sins. Okay? You have to receive that. All right, and then God ends it all um, there in the verse 22 by saying, For I am God, and there is none else. There's no aliens. <laughs> I think I've covered this before. We are the aliens. That's right, you know? Uh, how many millions, probably billions of dollars have been spent on SETI programs and all these, you know, big satellites and uh, just telescopes and different things and trying to, you know, uh, devices looking for alien life, you know? Man has just convinced himself there has to be more people like us or similar or other that's out there populated. You know? But according to the Bible, uh, from what we know, um, that's not the case. Uh, we're, we're it. And we're in a really big universe answering to a really big God. Okay? And he says, I'm it. Okay, and so look to him, okay, and he can help us, and he can get us out of this mess. You say, what mess? We're, we're in a mess. All of mankind is in a mess. We're under the curse of sin. You see it all around you. Uh, why do you think there's diseases? Why do you think there's pandemics? Why do you think people go through so much suffering and sorrow in this life and eventually die and, you know, why is there all of this? Okay? This is a result of sin. It's the consequences of sin and what it's brought upon us as mankind. It, it has a reaching effect uh, in, in so many ways, not just physical. Okay? We see the, the curse of sin on the earth and on creation, you know, uh, how, how things spoil. We need refrigerators. Things don't last very long. Uh, from, you know, to in ourselves, you know, we get older, we decay, we just, you know, we pass away. Um, and then there's the spiritual side of it, you know. So, uh, yeah, it encompasses so much and it's very real. And, and the only way out of this is God's way. He's the only one, okay, that we can look to for hope. He is our only hope. There is nothing else, okay. You can look for it, but you're going to waste your time. You're going to waste your life away. And you'll find out that the philosophies of man, Socrates and Plato and uh, whoever else, okay, uh, they will let you down, okay, uh, as far as an eternal hope goes. Okay. All right. Now, let's go to the book of Numbers, if you would. The book of Numbers, chapter 21, that's on page 195. We're getting close to the book of Numbers, amen, in our Bible reading. Going through the book of Leviticus, and the next book here is the book of Numbers. Let's go to Numbers, chapter 21. Does everybody see that picture? 
All right. Now, let's begin reading in, in verse, or I'm going to read there in verse 5, okay? Numbers chapter 21, verse 5, it says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. They said, Wherefore have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Remember, God led Israel out of Egypt uh, towards the promised land, the land of Canaan, which became the, the country, the nation of Israel. It says here, for there, they said, uh, For there is no bread, neither is there any water. Now, that's not true. Because God had given them manna. Okay? That was a false statement they made there. There's no bread. Neither is there any water, but God would provide them water. Okay? They were just complaining um, at this time and just kind of griping. Um, maybe they were traveling or whatever and there was just no water along the way and they just um, wanted it now or whatever. It wasn't God's time. Notice the last phrase. And our soul loatheth this light bread. So they, they said there's no bread, but yet they said there is bread. <laughs> They just didn't like what God provided. Do you ever uh, are discontent with what God's provided? Hmm. Oh, we might learn contentment. Amen. It says in verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. God judged them. There is judgment, right, for our actions. There's consequences for our sin. We do answer to God. This life is not a free ride. One day, we will all stand before God in judgment. There ain't nothing you can do about it. Nothing in the world. You might think, well, one day, I'm just going to die and go back into the ground. There ain't going to be no judgment for me. I'm telling you, you have no control what happens to you after you die. You better make sure you're saved, okay? You're in God's hand. All right? And so, in verse 7, people changed their attitude. They they got right. Um, therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. Okay, and that's when God can begin to help us. We admit, Lord, I'm wrong. My sin is wrong. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Uh, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass, everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. Um, uh, and uh, let me just mention here, anytime brass is mentioned, it's a type of judgment. And you talk about the brazen altar, or here we have the brazen serpent. Brass is a type of judgment in the Bible. And so Moses puts a a serpent of brass, type of judgment, uh, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. If he just looked at that brazen serpent on the pole that God had told Moses to put up, he lived. Okay? And that goes right along with what we just read there in Isaiah, where God said, look unto me. You say, Pastor Todd, now how is that serpent uh, something we should look to for hope? Well, that serpent back in the Old Testament was a type of Christ. Christ became sin for you. Believe it or not, Christ, God, God who knows no sin, God who has never done anything wrong, never thought an evil thought like us, uh, never ever has entered into him Okay, anything wicked, and yet he became sin for us on that old rugged cross. Much later, okay? He came and died for us later uh, down the line from this story. Christ came and he became like that serpent, a curse for me and for you. And when you look to him, the son of God who became a curse for you in your place, you can live. That's when you can be saved. All right? But you must look. Those that did not look, they died. Those that refused to do what God said, they died. And if you don't look to Christ and look to the sacrifice that he made and to the Savior, to the one who took your judgment on himself, which is what that serpent is a type of, um, 
then, yeah, you'll die. You'll die in your sins. And you'll stand before God one day in judgment. And what this is a picture of is that God has placed the judgment for our sins on his son, on Christ. If you die in your sins without believing on Christ and what he did for you, not looking to him like these people look to the brazen serpent, um, yeah, then you'll have to answer for your sins before God in judgment. And, and nobody can. You, you'll, there'll be nothing to say. You, you won't be able to defend yourself. You'll have lived your life the way you want to live it. You will refuse God's love and his way out, his way of salvation, and he'll throw the book at you like any good judge would. All right? Because he has to. We just read it today, okay? In Isaiah 45, he said, what did he say? He said, first, I am a just God. Then right after that, he said, but I'm also a savior, okay? He, he's, he's a just God, a just judge. He upholds righteousness. He's a holy God. He's a perfect God. Uh, and you wouldn't want him to be any other way because he's honest and we can trust him. At the same time, he's a savior. That's why he sent Christ. So that those before Christ could look forward to the day by faith. And so that we now, after the cross, can look back by faith. That God has sent our savior. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Thank God for the life we have in Christ. If we'll just look to him. <laughs> I'm so glad he made it simple. Amen. During these trying times, these last days in which we live, we must look to Jesus. As believers, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Remember I mentioned Stephen? Stephen kept his eyes by faith on Jesus. He did not become discouraged or frustrated. And God can do the same for us in these days. These are going to be frustrating days. Trying times in which we're living, these last days. But God can give his people grace. As soon as our spiritual eyes get off the Lord and get focused on the trouble or chaos that's around us, we immediately begin to sink into discouragement and frustration, don't we? Let's go to another passage now in Matthew, back in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 14, that's on page 1019. Page 1019. It's Matthew chapter 14. I feel like I'm preaching one of those messages at the nursing home, at the retirement home, where I show the slides and things. I, I really did enjoy those, you know? We had a great time. I always enjoy doing PowerPoints and stuff, so I'm doing something similar to that today with pictures and things for you. Hopefully to make it a little more interesting for you and just to have a picture in your mind of these events and things that happened in the Bible, true events, real things that happened. I remember as a kid growing up and, you know, reading the Bible story books that we had and all the, the pictures that they had of the different, um, you know, stories in the Bible. And uh, those are always uh, interesting to me. I always enjoyed those. All right, so here... We have uh, in Matthew chapter 14, I'm going to start reading at verse uh, 22. Verse 22. Um, is that same picture back up? Okay. Some reason it's not working on this one for some reason. Mm, okay, I think I got it now. Do you see that? 
How's that? Okay. I'm sort of getting the hang of it. Okay, so we're in Matthew chapter 14. Why don't you look at verse 22? Might help if I got there. Matthew 14, verse 22 says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship. He had just fed the 5,000. And so they're going to move on now. And he says, okay, get into the ship. And to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he would have been ministering in and around the Sea of Galilee where the Lord did most of his ministry. And it says, uh, verse 23, And when he had sent the multitudes away, all the people that had been there, you know, for the feeding of the 5,000, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. So the Lord wanted to be alone with the Father, and with his Father. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, the Sea of Galilee, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. So it was a very windy night, and so the disciples found themselves uh, in a bit of trouble. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. Now we've all heard about, you know, Jesus walking on the water. Well, here it is. And uh, this, this, this wasn't Canada, okay? This was, this was in Israel, okay? So it wasn't frozen. It was actual water he's walking on. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. They were thinking, oh my, look, there's a ghost, you know. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter, uh, Peter's kind of the um, outspoken one of the group, you know. He answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if this is really you, okay, and not a ghost, bid me come unto thee on the water. Uh, you know, I really do like, Peter, how he was willing to step out like that, you know, for the Lord. May we be willing to do the same when God wants us to do something that's a little scary, you know? And Peter was willing. And the Lord said, in verse 29, to Peter, and he said, come. And Peter was, um, when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But, verse 30, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me, <laughs> I'm going to drown. And so that's when the Lord reaches down and pulls him back up. Immediately, uh, and immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou, a little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? There he was, walking on the... Now, I know there was a storm or whatever going on, and wind and everything, and waves, and no doubt. Um, but at the same time, he was walking on the water with God. You know what I mean? He was walking on the water with the one who had created everything. The one who had created the water. The one who had created the wind. And, you know. And so the Lord says, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased immediately. <laughs> and that's when the disciples says, Oh, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. You know, and they worshiped him. Rightly so. Um, now, we are so much like Peter. Are we not? That's why God calls us sheep. We get, you know, turn aside so quickly, so easily. You know, we we stray. We, we get fearful easily, easily affrighted. Um, I don't know a lot about sheep, but I'm sure they're the kind of animals that you could freak out real easy, you know. They get scared easy. Uh, they run away, you know, they're fearful. Uh, we're so much like that. That's why it is so important that we keep our eyes on Jesus. Oh, Christian, are you keeping your eyes on Jesus? Your eyes of faith. We can do this, amen? We must do this. In Hebrews, it says, looking diligently. Looking, there's an ing there at the end of that word. Looking, we've got to always, all the time, be looking to Him, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. The grace of God doesn't fail, but the person fails. 
because they're not looking. It's your responsibility, Christian, to constantly be looking to Jesus. Take that responsibility. God's not going to make you look to him by faith. You have to do that. You have to be diligent in this. Looking diligent, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, which can happen. You know, we have a bad attitude, like the Israelites. I don't like this bread. Not content with God's will and, you know, what God's doing in our life right now. And then we start to complain and gripe and murmur, you know. Get fearful and doubt God. Peter was doubting God. Doubting that God could continue keeping him walking on the water you know he's like oh no I don't, I don't i don't believe god can do this you know and that's when he began to sink any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled you're going to defile those around you when you don't believe god when you don't look to jesus you're going to discourage others around you you're going to defile them with your bad attitude with your doubt with your fear you're going to um, encourage the other sheep to doubt God as well. You know, when uh, a lot of am animals that are in like a herd, when they get scared, what happens? One will take off and the others follow, don't they? And it's just like the whole herd, even though the other animals were not afraid, they, didn't even, they don't even know why they're running. But they're running away because maybe there was one or two that started to run. And so they all get fearful and they all start running, don't they? We're the same way. We have an effect on each other as believers. And thereby many be defiled. That's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Amen. Otherwise, we're going to get fearful and afraid and we're going to affect others by that. Now, if you would, go with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Our sin affects others. We may like to think that, oh no, my sin's private. I'm not affecting, I'm not hurting anybody. You're hurting yourself more than you know. And you will affect others because sin has a way of damaging you in, in, in so many ways. And so it affects your attitude, your spirit, uh, your remarks, your, your, your way you, you speak. I mean, it's just, yeah. Uh, page number 1292, Hebrews chapter 2, that's page 1292. Hebrews chapter 2, let's look at verse number 1. It says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. What have we heard from God in His Word? So many precious promises. How God says He'll take care of you. God will look after you. He loves you. He'll never forsake you. You know, We know all these verses. But we need to give the more earnest heed lest at any time we should let them slip. And that's what happens. We let them slip. During that moment that we get caught up in, when we get discontent or we start looking at the waves of life around us, we let them slip, don't we? All of a sudden, it's almost like we stop believing. I'm not saying you didn't believe on Christ to be saved, but for a moment there, looks like now you don't believe God's promises all of a sudden. How can that be? And yet it happens. Verse 2, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, we know how God dealt with the fallen angels and the devil, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them, that heard him, that heard his precious words and his precious promises. Oh, let's not neglect so great a salvation. It's a, not a salvation that just 
God saves you from hell and God makes you one of his children and all your sins are covered. It's, it's a salvation that we continue to experience. He continues to save us. Okay? I don't mean save you, you know, as far as making you a child of God. I mean, he saves you from trouble and, tr and, and through all the trials and, you know, difficulties of life. He continues to save you in that way. This salvation, is, con is he continues to, to work, okay? But we've got to look to him by faith and keep our eyes on him and not let what we've heard and his promises slip. Okay? Slip out of our hands, so to speak. We've got to hold on to them. Hold fast to those precious words because they're true words. God will never let us down. We would admit that, but in a moment when we're facing trouble, sometimes we're, we're doubtful of that, aren't we? O ye of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Why do you doubt me, God says? Why? Why would you doubt me? I'm the creator. I created everything. I created the waves. I created the water. I created the wind. Why would you be afraid, Peter? Why? There's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> You're with me. I'm God. I'm walking on the water with you. It seems crazy, you know. Why would Peter have been afraid? He was walking on the water with God. Who cares if there was a tornado, a hurricane? Who cares? You know, he's walking on the water with God. But yet we're the same way. We get our eyes off him. And too much on our troubles, don't we? You know it's true. Admit it. I know it's true. In my own life. Then it says in verse number four, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. God has proved himself over and over. Okay, we have his word. Uh, we have the record of his word. Those that saw him and experienced his miracles and walked with him. Uh, there's no reason for us to doubt. So let me just make a statement here. Faith is believing what God has said. Faith is believing what God has said. Number one, we are saved by believing what God has said. You're not saved by an experience necessarily or some kind of spiritual uh, experience. You're saved by believing what God has said. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That means publicly declare allegiance to. Okay? You're making him your your savior. You're, you're accepting him as you're accepting the gift of salvation. You're accepting what God did. And you publicly declare that. And the Bible says, And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You must believe in the resurrection. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? You must believe that. That's how he proved he was God. That's how we know that there's hope after death. Otherwise, there is no hope. Because he's it. He's the only one that ever raised himself from the dead. So, do you believe what God has said? Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe the gospel message? Do you believe the good news of salvation? That God has so wonderfully written to you in his precious word, his love letter to mankind. Do you believe it? He made a way. Will you believe it? Do you believe it? Number two, we are overcomers. Overcomers over all sin, difficulty, trials that we face in this life by believing what God has said. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God, saved, born again, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, keeping our eyes on him. Christian, do you believe the victory that you have in Christ? It's there. You have it. You can walk on water with God. You can walk above every difficulty of life, every trial you can face with him in the victory. This is a promise. 
And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We all, as the children of God, can look to him and overcome. That's a promise we have from the Lord. Now, look a little bit further there. If you're there in Hebrews chapter 2, look a little further to verse 9. What does it say? But we see Jesus. Amen. We've got to see Jesus. We've got to see him by faith. We've got to keep our eyes on him by faith and trust him. The previous verses here in chapter 2 and also in chapter 1, they talk about the angels. They talk about mankind. But neither of those are the answer. We've already covered that. Um, there's no hope in them. Only Christ. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Okay? We must see Jesus with the eye of faith. Now, there's four things I have here, uh, how we need to see Jesus, okay? How you must see Jesus. I've got a few more slides here for you. Um, let's see if I can figure this out. Okay. I need my sec I need my secretary to help me, you know. Oh, that didn't work, did it? Oh, how about that, eh? Okay, cool. I'm learning more and more. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll get it eventually. Okay. So, first thing. Uh, if we would put into practice looking to Jesus, if you uh, also are looking to the Lord to be saved. I, I think this goes for you know, here, saved or lost, okay? Uh, even after you're saved, you must continue to look to, to Christ as, as your king. But it, it's also very important for you to understand as a person who has yet to receive Christ that you must see Jesus as our sovereign. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 1 and you look at verse number 3, uh, it says, uh, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Okay, and that majesty on high is, is the throne of all. Okay, that's, that's like God's throne in the third heaven. That's, that's, that's the throne. Okay, not a throne, the throne. You go a bit further and look down at verse number 8. Uh, it, it says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of of thy kingdom. Now it does talk about the the we won't read all this about the angels here, but uh, there there are some people that actually believe there's there's some Christian cults, okay, like the Mormons, JWs. They teach that Jesus is an angel, you know, or like he's the brother of of the devil, brother of Satan, brother of Lucifer, and junk like that. No, 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 no. He is not an angel. Okay, there's a very distinct difference here. He is called God in verse 8, if you notice that. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God. He's the second person of the Godhead. All right? We must look to him as our true sovereign. He's your true king. He's the one that you answer to. Now, you might be able to choose in this life to move to a different country. Maybe you want to you move to Australia, you know, because you like the weather down there or something. I don't know. And you want to move down there. Um, and you could change governments, right? You could become maybe a citizen there eventually or something. But when it comes to Christ, when it comes to God, uh, he's it. And there's no way out of this. You, you can't answer to somebody else or say, I'll choose you know, who I want to be my God. There is no other God. He's the only one. And we all answer to him. He is your sovereign. And so we look to him, 
and his word, and he has a right to govern us. Okay. At the same time, there's, there's great protection when you submit to him as your rightful sovereign and king. Uh, and it's, it's a blessing. Uh, it's, I, I feel so secure, you know, knowing that he's in charge of me and my life. And uh, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm in his hand. And if, if I, I die, if I were to die today, the Bible says to die is to gain for the believer. It's actually a really good thing to die for a believer. Not for a lost person, but for a believer to die. Uh, it's, we, we can't lose because he's now my, my true king. And you know, I, I've, I've, I've accepted him and received his son in his way of salvation. He's, um, it, it's a fearful thing to think about. But it's even more fearful if you're not saved. Much more fearful. That's a fearful thing to think about, that one day you're going to stand before God and give an account for your life. Not a free ride. That's, that's, that's scary. Okay? But if you're a child of God and you're covered by the blood of His Son, uh, he's, he's paid for your sins in full, then, yeah, you don't have to be fearful in that respect. You know that you're His forever and He'll never let you go. Um, but we will be judged for this life and what we did with it, you know, for God. Okay? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says, Which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, that has to do with him being sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, man, looking forward to one day. Uh, serving the Lord, being a part of his kingdom. I, I don't know what I'll do. Maybe, maybe I'll um, sweep the floors. Maybe I'll clean the toilets. I don't know. But whatever God has me do, I'll be glad to do it. And, uh, man, that's going to be exciting, you know, just to be a part of, of his kingdom. Oh, when he's reigning and ruling here on earth. Okay, it's going to happen. So, number one, see Jesus, Christian. See Jesus as your sovereign. He's got, he's got everything under control. Okay? You're in his hand. You're secure. Um, those of you that have not received Christ, you must begin to see God this way. Okay? You answered him. Uh, you answer to his what his word says. He's he's told you very plainly, very clearly. You know what he expects out of you. Um, he expects you to be willing to turn from your way, turn from your sin. That's repentance, and and turn to him and believe on him with all your heart. Look to him, and you have that responsibility. Okay, as his sovereign, this is what he expects. We must see him this way. All right, let me see if I can go into the next one here. Okay. All right. Um, just bring it back up, and every time you want to go to the next slide, you can just hit your arrow. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> How could I forget that? Okay, I'll try it again. Here we go. Okay, number two. Can you see that? Yeah. Number two, Jesus must be seen as our substitute. Okay, look, if you're still there in Hebrews, look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. A crown, can, can you just imagine what God in the flesh went through for us? It's just unbelievable. Okay, For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, verse 10, for whom are all things... And by whom are all things, he's the creator, in bringing many sons unto glory. That's us. To make us the children of God. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Okay, so number two, Jesus, we must see him. You must see him as our substitute, as your substitute. He took your place. He did what you could not do. You could not pay for your sins. I don't know how, how much you try uh, to be good. You can't be good enough to pay for your sins. Um, just one sin has disqualified you and has condemned you forever before God. That, that's how much okay, he regards uh, righteousness and holiness and purity. 
Um, we are defiled before God. We do not deserve to live with God, do not deserve to live with God for all eternity by no means. Okay? Uh, what is eternal life with God worth? You, you can't put a, a number on that. You can't put an amount on that. It's worth more than you could ever pay or earn or work for. It, it has to be given because it's priceless. And it was given through Christ. Christ, he made the way so that we could be redeemed back to God. So we could be purchased, so our sins could be paid for. Okay, And Christ's blood did that. His sinless blood, when it was shed, that was God's blood that was shed that day on the cross. It paid for your sins, all of them, in full. As your substitute. Because you could not do it. As sinners, we are unacceptable to God. As an offering for our sin. That's why all those animals were a type of Christ to come, right? Him laying down his life for us. They put their hands on, a, on the head of that animal. And slay that animal and its blood would be shed. Type of Christ taking our sin personally on himself. On his head was our judgment. On him was our sin. And he paid for it in full. He was our substitute. See Christ, see Jesus as your substitute. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I'm so glad God made a way, amen? A ransom for us. He took care of it, paid in full. If you'll just but receive him, don't die in your sins. Okay, Don't think, well, I'm just going to chance this, and I'm going to see if everything's going to work out. I'm telling you, it's not going to work out. It's not going to work out. Um, uh, you know, I, I plead with you. I plead with you. Don't take a chance. Don't don't risk, you know, uh, things. You're, you're dealing with eternal things. You're dealing with spiritual things here, okay? There's a spiritual side to this that you don't see. Like so many things in the universe that we don't see, but they're very real, Okay, gravitational forces, nuclear forces, you, you name it. Okay, there's a lot of things that are real, but you don't see them. Uh, the spiritual realm is just as real as the physical. Again, this life is not a free ride. You answer to God. He's your sovereign. Look, he's made a substitute for you. You must receive his love. Please don't reject what he's done for you. A way out. Uh, of this this curse that we're under, all of us, of sin. And uh, answering before a righteous, holy God one day. Receive him, the substitute, okay? All right, and then, that leads me to number three, he becomes your savior, all right? If you'll receive the substitute, that's when you experience the freedom from bondage, the bondage of sin. Look in, uh, if you're there in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, look at verse 14 now. For as much, then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Yes, he's real. He's a real creature, okay? Very powerful angel, a fallen angel. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. If you've not received Christ, you're in bondage to sin. You're bent towards sinning, and you can't stop yourself. Okay, I don't know if you've noticed that by now, but it's it's just it's it's a life of bondage. It uh, it controls you. You can't tr control it. It controls you. Through Christ, there's freedom from sin. The truth shall make you free, the Bible says. If you'll see him as your true sovereign, if you'll see him as your substitute and receive him as your savior, then you'll experience this freedom, okay, from the bondage of sin. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought to life and immortality to light through the gospel. Okay? 
There's hope in him. He's the Savior. We need saving. Notice that verse that said, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's not just a good example. He's not just a great teacher that lived long ago, a great prophet. Uh, he was, he is, but he's much more than that. He's your Savior. He's one that you look to to save you, okay, and deliver you. He can deliver you from that spiritual bondage that you're in, that you're experiencing. The addictions and just all the things, okay, that, that bind us, whatever it is, whatever you have a struggle with, whatever you have a problem with that you know is sin and displeasing to God. God can break you away from that, that pull that it has, that control that it has on you. Not to say that you won't, be, uh, you won't sin again. You can still sin, even after you're saved. But you'll find the Lord will help free you from it. Okay? And he'll give you victory over it. Okay? That's what is promised to God's children. And all you need to do is look to him. <laughs> See him as your sovereign. See Jesus as your substitute. See him as your savior. Okay? Not trusting yourself and what you can do. Okay? Look totally, completely to him. Okay, and then we have the last one. I got it now. I got to figure it figured out. See Jesus as our succorer, okay? Word succorer means uh, helper, one that helps you. Okay, if you look down in verse 17, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be, this is why God became a man. He, he knows what we go through. He's experienced being one of us. He's, he's not like us. He's a spirit. Everywhere all at the same time, but for 30 some years he became a man that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation. And it means for two parties to be made right again together that were once opposed. Our sin makes us opposed to God. It makes us aliens to God, aliens to what's right in the, in the family of God outside of the commonwealth of Israel. Uh, by faith through Christ, we're made a part of the family of God. And we are reconciliated with, with God. Uh, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, verse 18, For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He knows what we go through, amen? He knows the struggles that we have. He knows the struggles you have, Christian. And he gives grace for every trial, Amen? But we must keep our eyes on him. We must see him as the only one that can help us. Not our intelligence. Even after you're saved, you know. Well, I got I to gotta work this out in my mind. You know, I got to figure out a way for this to work, you know. or No, no. Look to him. Look to Christ. See Jesus as your succorer. Okay? Um. He will be that for you, Christian. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We have a helper. Amen? Our Lord Jesus Christ. He's there for us. He will help us. He'll see us through. We need to see Jesus in these four ways. Okay, now go with me to chapter 12, and we'll just end today with this last passage, Hebrews chapter 12, page 1303, Hebrews chapter 12, and just verses 1 and 2 there. Let's end with this, this passage today. Thank you so much for your attentiveness today and for uh, joining us. I pray the Lord will help you and to see the truth, acknowledge the truth. Our hope is in him. It's not It's not in us. It's not in me. It's not in the Baptist church. It's not in the Presbyterian church. It's not in the Catholic church. It's not in the Buddhist. It's not in the, uh, the Muslims. It's, um, it's not in the philosophies of man. It's not in the intelligence or the knowledge of, of man. It's totally, completely in God, in Christ. Okay? You can trust this book. You can trust the Bible. It's tried and proven. 
Okay? How many times have I said, uh, all the prophecies that it has foretold have come to pass to date. Here we are, February the 14th, Happy Valentine's Day, 2021. Okay? All the prophecies that the Word of God, every single one of them, all of them, okay? That everything it's foretold, whether it's hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago, has come to pass to date. That's a really good record. Where in, the, where in the world can you find a book like that? Where? Name it. You won't find it. Okay? You can trust what God says. Now the responsibility is laid upon you, oh unsaved, lost one that has not received Christ yet, to believe what he has said. And the responsibility is laid upon me and you, Christian, to continue to believe what God has said. And to look to Jesus. Amen? Now, let's just close here with these last two verses. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, there are so many that have gone on before us, okay? They're cheering us on. They're saying, go for God. Believe God. It's worth it, you know? <laughs> Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't look at the waves. Don't murmur. Don't complain about things in your life that don't seem to be working out the way you'd like them to. Be content. Serve God. Look to Him. You know, they're like, they're our cheerleaders, okay? All these saints of God in the previous chapter, chapter number 11. The great hall of faith. Uh, they got their pom-poms up there, amen? They're like, hey, go for God. Go on, you know, keep, you know, serving God, believing Him. Um, we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And notice this last phrase, verse 1. Verse number one, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Run with patience. Oh, how we need to run this race with patience. So often we're not very patient with God, are we? We want things on our timetable. We want things to work out the way we want them to, when we want them to. You know? And we're not running with patience. You say, Pastor Todd, how can I learn to run with patience? Well, God tells you in the very next verse. He gives you the answer in the very next verse. Isn't that nice? You don't have to look too far for it. It's in the very next verse. Looking unto Jesus. That's it. Looking unto Jesus. Keeping your eye of faith on Him. And then when you do that, to the author and the finisher of our faith, you will experience his patience. Amen? As he helps you. He will be your succorer. He will be your helper. You experience that grace because your eyes are on him. Amen? Oh, look to Christ. Look and live. My brother, live. There's hope in Christ. He gives purpose. He gives meaning for life. I don't know what I'd do without Jesus. I don't know what I'd do without God and His Word. What would I do? I just, I don't know. I, I guess I'd be living for myself and my family and a few friends and just, I don't know, my hobbies and things. And uh, I'd have a problem with sin, a lot of problem with sin. And it would probably be wrecking my life, you know, and causing a lot of harm to me. I wouldn't have any peace inside. I wouldn't be ready to die. You know, people people think they are. They think, yeah, yeah, I got this. I'll be okay. Uh, I've heard people say, I've heard lost people make statements like, you know, yeah, I got this all worked out with the man upstairs. They got this this idea in their mind, you know, that things are going to be all right and and that they can defend themselves. If they do, if it, if the Bible is true, you know, one day we do stand before God in judgment. I'll be able to answer for myself. I'll be able to tell God, no, no, let's listen here, God. You know, I was a good person. You know, I knew some people, you know, some friends and acquaintances, you know, and family, you know, they were much worse than me, you know. And and you want to, and you're thinking you can make your case, you know, before God. But the thing they don't get and don't understand is what the Bible says, we are all condemned. We are all deserving of God's wrath and judgment. And it don't matter if you were, you know, a pretty good person or a really bad person. You're still condemned either way. 
before God. And so, oh, yes, we must look to him. He's our only hope. He says, look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is none else. Amen. I'm so glad for that hope that we have in him today. Amen. And hope for us, Christian, um, to live a life of victory by faith and believing what God has said and keeping our eyes on him.